Welcome back to season two of What Your GP Doesn't Tell You, the podcast for both doctors and patients with me, Liz Tucker. Today, I'm talking to psychiatrist Professor David Healy, who's a particular interest in drug safety. He was one of the first psychiatrists to suggest, while in some cases the antidepressant drugs, the SSRIs, may help prevent thoughts of suicide, in other very rare cases, they might actually increase the suicide risk. So how then does a doctor balance that risk? David also discusses the evidence from healthy volunteer trials. These are small trials that take place before the major trials, and sometimes regulators may be unaware of these trials' results, yet they can contain important information about a drug's potential side effects. And David also discusses the problems of sexual dysfunction that some people suffer after taking SSRI drugs. He says his personal experience of several patients who have committed suicide as a result of this ongoing sexual dysfunction. And he's even been asked by people suffering from this to write referral letters to the Right to Die group, Dignitas. But before we get to David's interview, a request from me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to find out more, you can sign up to my Substack account, which is liztucker.substack.com. Go to my podcast website at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com and follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker. And if you'd like to financially support the podcast, I'd really appreciate it. A huge amount of work goes into both the research and production of this. So even a small amount a month makes a huge difference. And you can provide support at patreon.com slash what your GP doesn't tell you or via my website, which, as I mentioned, is what your GP doesn't tell you dot com. Many thanks. And now back to the interview with David. Psychiatrist David Healy is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster's University in Canada. He's also a founder and CEO of Database Medicine Limited, which aims to make medicine safer through online direct patient reporting of drug side effects. And he's been involved as an expert witness in homicide and suicide trials involving psychotropic drugs and in raising issues about these medications with the American and European regulators. And just to let you know, due to an issue with the microphone, you'll notice a change in the sound dynamic in David's answers after the first couple of minutes. Here's David's interview. So, David, thanks very much indeed for joining the podcast today. Uh, it's good to be here, Liz. You've appeared as an expert witness in court cases involving the pharmaceutical industry. You've regularly spoken out about drug safety. But your critics would say, you know, you're not a disinterested witness. You come with a definite anti-pharma perspective. What's your response to that? My response is two or threefold. First of all, I'm not remotely anti-pharma, uh, and I'm pro-drug, and I'm pro the medical model. The people I've had grief from usually have been clinical people, other doctors. I've had very little grief, per se, from the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, I've had a great deal of help. A lot of the things that people are going to hear during the course of the next hour are things that have been actually sent my way by people working within the pharmaceutical industry. So I'm not remotely anti-pharma. They're just operating the system. And it's people like me, doctors like me, that are failing the people that they use these pills for. So why is it then, David, that so many of your clinical colleagues would take a different perspective to you? It depends what you mean by a different perspective. If you're talking about the fact that there's a lack of access to trial data, nobody can take a different perspective. In terms of access to the data from the trials companies run, we don't have access to any of it. The other thing that really people can't quibble about is ghost written literature. But I think the bottom line is, for me, uh, for doctors in particular who are figuring that I've got the wrong end of the stick on this, they need to wake up, I think, and smell the coffee. Just picking up, David, on the point about ghostwriting. By that, you mean that the named authors on the paper are not actually the people who've drafted the paper? Yes. When I actually became aware of this first, this is 25 years ago or so, when I agreed to get involved in a pharmaceutical company meeting, and I was told, you know, we're going to produce some papers from this meeting. I said, fine, that's great. 
Shortly afterwards, I had an email saying, and here's your paper. I was interested in this because, I mean, I hadn't thought that they were going to write the paper for me. I thought I was going to be writing the paper. And it was a great Healy paper. It said things that I say in the way that I say them. It was full of Healy references and things like that. So much so that if I was to put this paper down in the midst of a bunch of papers that I'd written and ask people who knew me well to pick out the paper that I didn't write, they wouldn't have picked this one out. I had, at this point, written the paper, the one that I thought that I was going to have to write. So I emailed it over to the company and said, I plan to write my own paper, and here it is. And the reply, gosh, that's not bad. We actually rather like this one. But there are some important commercial messages in the other one, so we need to get that published too. So what we'll do is we'll get one of the other people at the meeting to be the author of that. And what does the company mean that the paper contained important commercial messages? One of the key points here is regulators like FDA and MHRA regulate claims companies make. When they get their drug approved, they can say that this drug is going to ensure that you get to heaven. But if an academic like David Healy says that, they can cite the article by someone like me in order to make the claim they want to make, but which regulator hasn't approved the evidence for this claim. It's impossible to know exactly how many papers are ghostwritten. But is your argument, David, that where papers are ghostwritten, that should be much clearer than it is? My argument is it's got nothing to do with science. Now, moving on to the topic of antidepressant trials, what defines whether something's viewed by the regulator as an antidepressant or not? Now, let them use the word antidepressant. If on a depression rating scale, there's a fall, which is a very minor fall. If the company meets that, then they can use the word antidepressant. Depression's measured in something called Hamilton points. And if those Hamilton points drop by a few points, the drug is deemed to be effective. Although there is a debate that the drop in the Hamilton points is too small to be clinically measurable. Well, it's even more than that, uh, which is companies only need to show it in two clinical trials. And there can be, you know, they may have done much more clinical trials. And if you add them all up, there's no drop at all. If they can give FDA two placebo controlled trials where there's a fall on the Hamilton rating scale of two or three points, FDA will say, well, you can use the word antidepressant. Now, one of the issues that you've raised about the SSRI drugs is that although in certain cases they may reduce the risk of suicide, that in other very rare cases, they may actually increase the risk. There's been several crises about, are these drugs working and do they cause people to become suicidal? So FDA have reviewed the data as of 2004, 2006, and asked all of the companies on more than one occasion to send them their clinical trial data. As I found talking to FDA, I knew about clinical trials that happened in children in France that FDA didn't have a clue about. A drug that can cause people to commit suicide can equally save lives, can prevent people actually committing suicide. The older drugs are much more powerful antidepressants than the SSRIs. They treat a condition called melancholia, which is severe mood disorder. And you can expect that this is an illness that does cause people to commit suicide. The people who get SSRIs, for the most part, don't have a condition that's going to lead them to actually commit suicide. If you had a drug that cures melancholia, you'd expect, well, yes, the drug might in that clinical trial cause some people to commit suicide or to try to commit suicide, but equally it would cure an illness that leads to people actually committing suicide. And overall, less people might actually commit suicide. The SSRIs don't work for melancholia. So this is why in clinical trials of just SSRIs, the risk is more obvious. But David, on the placebo arm, were there not also people who'd committed suicide? There's extremely few, and it's awfully hard to work this out because uh, the companies have categorized as placebo suicides, people who weren't taking placebo. For instance, people who are in the placebo arm of a clinical trial, and when the trial comes to an end, if they're free to go on active treatment, they may be put on an SSRI, shortly after which they commit suicide, and their 
categorized as a placebo suicide. I think it'll be really surprising to doctors and patients that a placebo suicide can be defined as someone who's taken a drug. I thought the whole idea of the placebo was someone who hadn't taken any medication. Well, the company draws up a protocol which says we we will keep an eye on people over the 30-day period after the formal trial ends, that we may put you on other drugs. In the case of the active treatment arm, you know, we're going to hold the SSRI that you are on. So you're going to go into withdrawal. And if you go into withdrawal, they count that as a placebo suicide also. When the companies brought the SSRIs on the market, they didn't want antidepressants. They wanted anxiolytics. They wanted a tranquilizer. They wanted to treat people for nerves, people who are anxious. They didn't want the rare people who got melancholia. They wanted the people who were taking benzodiazepines. But there was a fuss in the 1980s about people getting hooked to benzodiazepines. So the company view was, well, we won't be able to market these drugs as anxiolytics that you don't get hooked to. Let's change things. Let's let's get them called antidepressants instead. Now, the other thing is, companies have done healthy volunteer trials. They've done those before the drugs come on the market. And these healthy volunteer trials are usually pretty small, and the regulator won't necessarily be aware of them. That's right. When, in the case of Pfizer's SSRI, there was a very famous healthy volunteer trial which happened in Leeds, all of the women in the trial within the first week have been put on sertraline, became agitated and couldn't go on with it. Now, when the drug came on the market, I checked later on after I found out about this, I checked with MHRA whether they had seen this healthy volunteer trial and MHRA said no. So how do the MHRA or FDA, when they're approving a drug, balance the risks and benefits? FDA are not in the business of telling us whether we should use these drugs or not. FDA are depending on the case of drugs that there's doctors, the people who consume these drugs and who don't die from them are your doctor who prescribes it. You don't. I consume these drugs by putting them in your mouth. And if you die, well, that's tough. You know, it was the illness. I will always say it was the illness that caused the problem. It gives me a huge incentive to say that it's the illness that actually caused the problem that you have. And, you know, we need more drugs. Maybe the problem was I should have had you on a a much higher dose or on three or four drugs rather than just one. So FDA, in a sense, can say this is nothing to do with us. We just let this drug on the market and let companies use the word antidepressant. The safety issues after that are a medical issue. They're not an FDA issue. The problem is Let's say I put you on one of these drugs. You come into me and, you know, you've been on one of the SSRIs for a few days or a week or two. Say, well, well, I'm feeling worse. I'm having much more suicidal thoughts. And these are really bizarre, grisly thoughts. When you come in and say these things to me, that's the point. Both you and I have all of the data in the room. You're there semi-convinced the drug must be causing it. I'm slightly biased against thinking, that anything I did with good intentions could have caused a problem. But if we both end up thinking, yes, the drug has caused the problem, if I report this to MHRA, they don't get in touch with you. And without being in touch with you and interviewing you and seeing all of your records, they're not in a good position to work out, could the drug have caused the problem in this case? So, David, the regulator is not following up individual patient reports about side effects with either the doctor or patient to see if they're linked to the medication. Yeah, in order to work out has the drug caused a problem, you've got to follow a person up. You've got to do things like increase the dose, reduce the dose. Maybe if you reduce the dose and thing clears up and we reintroduce it and it comes back, well, this is compelling evidence that at least in your case, the drug has caused this. But a lot of people, both uh, the public and doctors also, seem to think that The bureaucrats are the experts on this, where the bureaucrats are passing the buck, saying, this isn't our job. These guys report to us, but it's not really our job to work out how to cause the problem. It's their job. And that's where people like me are failing. We should be making it clear that we use these drugs and a certain proportion of people are helped, but others become suicidal. And 
before you take a drug, I need to let you know that there is a risk this could happen so that you feel free to come in and say to me that this is what's happened. Too many people these days actually go to doctors and things are going wrong in treatment and they feel too scared to mention it. Figure this nice person will actually get nasty if I talk about problems on the pills. And in your experience as a consultant psychiatrist and the many patients that will have been referred to you by GPs, other doctors, what percentage of your patients do you think are alerted to the potential problems before they start taking these drugs? Very few. We've got a situation where in the case of the use of the SSRIs for children, there have been 30 trials done, all negative. But all of the publications are positive. So the, the So explain explain that, David. Yeah. The most famous trial was study three to nine. The actual article came out in two thousand and one. What had happened was when the antidepressants came out first in the late nineteen fifties, through the nineteen sixties and onwards, people figured, well, there are some children possibly depressed. And they ran clinical trials to see did the older antidepressants work for children, teenagers who appeared to be depressed. They found that no, they didn't. There were 15 trials done, all negative. But when the SSRIs came on the market, they came with a lot of hoopla that they're cleaner, purer drugs. And maybe these are the drugs that we're going to be able to show work for children, teenagers who have become depressed. So during the 1990s, mid-1990s, a group of companies began trials with their SSRIs for teenagers who are depressed. And this includes Prozac, Siroxat, and all of the other drugs. Now, at the Siroxat trial started in around 1994, there were so few children who were viewed then as being depressed that it took years to run. They had begun with six different hospitals. They had to open it up to six more to try and recruit the numbers of children into uh, the trial to make it work. And in 2001, an article came out in the journal with the highest impact factor in child psychiatry. It had an authorship line to die for. There were 22 people there who were all huge names in the field. They are coming from the best hospitals and the best universities. Well, if you're the average doctor looking at an article like this, you'd figure, well, any teenager that comes into me who seems to be remotely unhappy, I should be putting them on this drug or one of the drugs from this group. Turns out that the document showing that actually the clinical trial results looked very different, that the drug didn't work and it wasn't safe, found its way to New York State a few years later, who decided to take action against GSK. GlaxoSmithKline was sued by the New York State Attorney General's office over two million prescriptions that had been written for children and adolescents in the US after a marketing campaign which had characterised Study 329 as demonstrating remarkable efficacy and safety. Although the original paper had reported that the antidepressant peroxidin, otherwise known as Paxil, was generally well tolerated and effective, a major review published in the BMJ, looking at tens of thousands of pages of original trial documents from Study 329, concluded that the antidepressant peroxidine was neither safe nor effective in adolescents with depression. In actual fact, in the trial, there were 18 children who had serious behavioural events taking peroxidine. So they underreported by a factor of at least fourfold. What actually happened? And it turned out that the first draft of this paper, which was ultimately published in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, was not written by any of the 22 named authors, but by a ghostwriter hired by GSK. But David, how was the paper able to claim that there were no serious side effects? The company view, and this is um, an extremely important point, the drugs we use is they have no adverse events because none of our trials have shown that the problems happen to a statistically significant extent. And the issue that you are raising is that if the people running the trial do not look for certain side effects and patients aren't asked about them, then we don't know whether they're occurring or not or at what rate they might be occurring. Yes, it's just not science. Now, the problem is 
you've got a lot of people, experts in the field, profs in pharmacology, profs in therapeutics, profs in medicine, who let this go by. At root of this is this issue of who gets to see what information. So basically, the pharmaceutical industry will send trial reports, which are several thousand pages long, to the regulators, but they won't send the individual patient reports. And then the peer reviewers see even less information than the FDA does. FDA have a bit more material, as you say. When an article comes to a journal, those who peer review it don't really have anything other than the article that has been written. They never get to see the data behind it. And no one gets access to the patients who are the real data. I mean, when when you hear the word data, people think figures. But in the case of one of the Pfizer trials, a man became terribly agitated on the drug he was on and decided to kill himself. He poured petrol all over himself, but only died from his burns five days later. In that trial, he was coded as death by burns. Now, in order to work out what had happened in, the, in that trial and if death by burns, which, you know, if you just read death by burns, you think, well, accidents happen. You know, so maybe it's just an accident. You'd need to be able to get hold of his mother, our wife or whoever, and ask her what happened in order to work out, well, was this really death by burns or was this a suicide? It's the people. People are the data. And where people are missing, where you're just provided with kind of sheets of paper which have loads of figures on them, that's not science. And the FDA can go back and request information, but of course they don't know what information they don't have. Yeah, they, they just see things like death by burns and they figure, well, this is just an accident. Regulators are encouraged to partner industry. It's a bit like if we think about you know, the food industry. We really want more foods. I mean, you know, people don't want to just stick with carrots and turnips and this, that and the other. They want food to which all sorts of things have been added to make them more interesting or whatever. Um, and it's a bit the same with drugs. Everybody wants more drugs and the regulators are encouraged to ensure that we have more drugs unless there's a very serious problem. We're talking about the FDA, but the truth is, wherever you are in the world, the FDA is the most powerful regulator. And the regulators around the world, the MHRA, the EMA, the other regulators, all tend to take their lead from the FDA. So wherever you are in the world, what the FDA does matters. Yes, absolutely. You've touched on this idea that for a drug to be approved, all that is needed is two positive trials. So I could have a drug, I could have 50 negative trials, but as long as I've got two positive trials, the drug will be approved. Yes, and that's... That should bring home to you the bureaucratic nature of what FDA are doing and MHRA are doing. They really aren't in the business of looking overall, is this a good drug or is it likely to save lives or whatever. They, they have a box to tick. And if the company enables them to tick a box, which is two placebo controlled trials, then the FDA will tick the box and MHRA will too. And what's interesting is because sertraline is recommended as first-line treatment, but if you actually look at the negative trial data, you get an entirely different picture of this drug. Yes, it becomes one of the antidepressants to steer clear of it. Depending on what data your GP has seen, you might walk into his or her surgery, and that might be the first SSRI that's recommended. Yeah, no, no, sure. And this is where you know, it's a bit tricky for Doctors, they've read the New England Journal of Medicine, they believe in God, which is the FDA or the regulator or whatever. Who are they going to go with? Are they going to go with you or are they going to go with what the Bible says? And they tend to go with what the Bible says, not realizing that uh, science happens when they meet you and talk to you. So, David, as a patient, if my GP says to me, I think this would be a good drug for you, I haven't really got informed consent because neither I or my GP has access to the full data. Yeah, a lot changed around the time the SSRIs came in the market. The kind of received medical wisdom was we're using poisons out of which we hope to bring good. But it's critically important that I as a doctor remember that I'm giving you a poison and probably a good idea to let you know this too. What the pills have become since then has been sacramental. 
a sacrament is something that can only do good, it can't do harm. So the natural caution has gone out the window. And this shows most clearly, I think, in the case of teenagers taking SSRIs. It really wasn't a good idea for parents to think that it might be a good idea for their teenager to be on an SSRI. Teens didn't particularly think about taking these drugs until recently, but now we've got escalating numbers of teens taking these drugs. Paradox is we've got Greta Thunberg's generation who are doing such great things about saying we're putting too many chemicals in the environment, who are putting more chemicals into their inner environment than any previous generation of teens ever did. What you're saying is we haven't got a single positive trial that suggests that these drugs work for teenagers, yet the number of children, teenagers on these drugs is going up. So on what basis are any of these drugs being prescribed? We've now, since the 1980s, we've got health services. Health has become a service industry, and everything in the system is geared to giving you more pills. Even when you're not ill, giving you pills to treat risk factors like your lipid levels or your bone densities or whatever. This is where companies these days make the money. They don't make the money out of treating you when you need treatments for heart attacks or strokes or psychosis. They make the money out of giving you pills when you're well. But if you go to your GP and you say, look, I've been taking this antidepressant for two years, I really want to come off it. I would hope that he or she would be sympathetic to that and come up with a tapering strategy. There will be some who do, but for the most part, they won't be. When the SSRIs came to the market first, the recommendations were you be on an antidepressant for three to six months maximum. We now have people who are on them 20 years. And a lot of these people will write into your program afterwards saying you shouldn't have had David Healy on at the program because my SSRI has saved my life. There may be people for whom that's true, but for a great number of people, what happens is when they try to reduce the dose a bit, they feel awful. And they interpret that as the underlying illness for which they need continuing treatment. It's not. They're now dependent on the drug. And yes, they need the drug to ensure that they don't feel so awful because of the dependence. This is a real public health problem. We've got 15% of the population in the UK now on these drugs. Now, one of the side effects that a number of patients on these drugs report are problems of sexual dysfunction. Yes, There's a suggestion that it's not just people suffering these effects while they're on the drug, but that even when they come off the drug, that for a proportion of people, that sexual dysfunction remains. Yes, and uh, this is a big surprise. People like me would have said to you during the 1990s, if you talked about being unable to make love or things not being quite right, I'd have said, well, things will be fine once you hold the pill. But that's all wrong. We don't know how big the problem is because a lot of people don't try to hold the drug. But in terms of people who do, some people coming off the drugs expecting things to go back to normal found that actually things didn't go back to normal. They got worse. People can remain unable to make love for 10, 20 years after they have halted the pills. These are issues that we don't understand. And there's a Nobel Prize to be won for a person who cracks the problem. And David, you've suggested that for some patients, the problems of sexual dysfunction become overwhelming. Well, I know of two or three people who have been in contact with me who have actually committed suicide. We get inquiries from people who uh, say, can you write a referral letter for me to Dignitas? If people had any hope that there was research happening, that there might be an answer, they'd be less likely to think this way. But There can be no research happening on this, partly because the companies making the drugs don't want to recognize that there could be a problem like this, so they're not going to do the research. But also when they go along to their doctor and explain, look, I've been off this drug for months and uh, I'm still not able to make love. The response from doctors has been, drug can't be causing a problem when it's out of your body for months. Uh, you, You must be depressed. Can I give you an antidepressant? And the number of people who are showing symptoms of sexual dysfunction while they're on the drug There seems to be quite a wide number of percentages quoted in the literature. What's your sort of sense of the percentage of patients while they're on the drug who are suffering sexual dysfunction? Actually depends on how you define the problem. For the most part, it's going to inhibit you from being able to make love. It's going to be less pleasurable than it should be. Because it's less pleasurable and more like hard work, 
you're going to be less inclined to. So these things build up over a period of time. But there is a further problem, which is that a proportion of people who go on the drug, rather than being, being numbed by the drug, can find themselves more generously irritable. And one of the things that can happen when you hold drugs, and it's more women than men, and this gets written up in you know, the media as woman who has 80 orgasms per day. It's terribly uncomfortable. They don't want it to happen. And women go to the extent of having a clitoridectomy in order to see can they try to halt it happening. So given the issues you've raised, what's your rationale for putting a patient on an SSRI drug? First of all, I'm pro-drugs, and people listening to this program shouldn't think that I'm not. And I believe in the medical model. But believing in the medical model and figuring it's a good idea that we have a wide range of drugs is not incompatible with being slow to use them. 200 years ago, a man called Philippe Pinel, who was a man who in essence created the medical model where mental illness is actually concerned, said, it's a great thing to have treatments that might cure, but it's an even greater art in knowing when not to give them. Now, one of the biggest issues that I'm faced with these days is teenagers coming in desperately wanting SSRIs. And it's awfully hard to persuade them that this isn't a good idea. You know, you literally can end up in trouble if you don't give an SSRI. I don't give them and have ended up in trouble because of it. That doesn't mean there isn't a place for these drugs. Like in the case of people who've got crippling OCD, the drugs can be awfully useful. But as I've hinted before, there are other options than the SSRIs. There's nicotine, for instance, which is quite good for OCD. Clinical medicine is a complex juggling act. It really should involve a lot of listening to people. And ideally, it shouldn't be the case when you come in to see me that you see a different person each time. It should be that we have an opportunity to build up a relationship. And it should be much more relationship-based medicine I think if you keep the same doctor, your life expectancy is likely to be longer. This is it. There's an increasing amount of evidence. We can have eight, nine, ten drugs, uh, you know, which could all be good drugs we are, and which teenagers in the United States and here in the UK increasingly are on. You've got teenagers who are taking ten psychotropic drugs. Now, each of these drugs may work in their own right, but there's increasing evidence that if you go above three drugs they're not going to be working the way they would do if you were on each of them on their own. So in order to get the benefit of drugs, we're in you know, the kind of position we've got loads of things which work, but actually for you to get the benefit from these things, it's a tricky business if you go over three drugs. You've got to work out which are the three I really need. And people figure that if they all work, if I'm taking eight or nine, I'm going to live longer. Well, in actual fact, no, you're going to have a reduced life expectancy, you're more likely to go into hospital and your quality of life is going to be worse. Well, Dave, we touched on the different levels of access to data the different groups have, but one of the key issues which affects what GPs and what consultants do are the guidelines written in the different countries. Here in the UK, we have NICE. And NICE isn't operating on full information either. It's only operating on the data which is accessible from the company and from the peer-reviewed literature. Yeah. I think NICE, when it comes to drugs, I mean, there may be other things they do which don't relate to drugs, which aren't a problem in uh, the same kind of way. So the guidelines came out first. They were all about telling us what not to do. Don't strip varicose vein. But if industry do trials, for instance, in children who are diagnosed as being bipolar, NICE feel compelled to report on the fact, well, there is some evidence that this antipsychotic given to Two-year-olds who are bipolar can be... Two-year-olds? Yes, two-year-olds. Up to 1990, the received wisdom was you never have a bipolar disorder before your teenage years. That's the earliest time it can start. It's usually later than that. It's rare to have it in your early teenage years. But in the United States at the moment, you have children being diagnosed bipolar in utero. On what basis... How do you make a diagnosis that a fetus is bipolar? There's a famous book which goes into this, and it's highly recommended. It's by academics, and it's got wonderful endorsements by 
all sorts of puffs of mental health or whatever. And uh, the book says clearly, you know, our view is that when children are particularly hyperactive in the womb, it invariably turns out that they're bipolar later in life, and we really should be treating them much earlier than we are. This is a best-selling book. It was best-selling within six months of the now. Best-selling in the United States means that you've sold 70,000 copies. But what I don't understand about NICE, it's got a lot of money, it's quite a powerful potential lobbying organisation. Would they not be the sort of organisation that should be able to lobby for greater data transparency? Yes. Both NICE and Cochrane, the evidence-based medicine movement, had a great opportunity around 2004 when the crisis blew up about children becoming suicidal on SSRIs. NICE were in the middle of writing guidelines for the treatment of childhood depression. There's a Lancet paper about this and an editorial. The editorial was called Depressing Research. So this is a moment in uh, 2004 when there was a chance to turn things around and do things the way they ought to have been done. NICE and Cochrane decided not to take that opportunity. They told a uh, House of Commons Health Select Committee that I testified to that the things David Healy was saying about these things are just not right. Ghost written articles appear in peripheral journals and have no influence on things. That's not the case. They appear in the very best journals and they're highly influential. And if NICE are not looking at the negative trial data, I mean, I think there was a study in 2008 by Dr. Eric Turner, who previously worked at the FDA, which reports that one third of negative trials done in adults with antidepressants were published as positive. That's going to skew any result. Oh, completely. NICE are going to have to base their guidelines on the published literature. So if the companies publish their trials in a particular way, like they don't publish some that are negative, but even worse, publish some that are negative and publish them as positive, they're going to, in essence, write the NICE guidelines for NICE. Supposing you wanted to sit on a NICE guideline committee, what would be the process? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, the people listening in here will probably not be surprised to know that NICE haven't actually approached me to sit on any of their committees. Because you would be perceived as being anti-sympathetic to the pharmaceutical industry. I would regard myself as a very conservative and traditional doctor. I'm not radical and I'm not critical. I believe in the medical model. I believe in drugs. But I also believe it's kind of important to know when not to use them. Now, that's certainly going to cut down on company sales. And in particular, the idea about using drugs for risk factors to thicken up your bones or lower your lip levels and things like that, I'd be very cautious about that. Not saying you can't use them, but very cautious about it. Uh, and I guess from that point of view, companies are going to view their sales as being at risk from a person like me. But that's not the same thing as being anti the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, put it like this to you. When the crisis blew up about the antidepressants causing children to become suicidal, the American Psychiatric Association rushed out a paper saying the APA believes that antidepressants save lives. Now, my view was they'd made a bad mistake. What they should have said was that the APA believes that psychiatrists save lives. My worry is that it's not clear to me whether the wider public are going to lose faith in drugs or are they going to lose faith in doctors. So finally, David, people listening to this think all oh, this sounds a bit esoteric, something that's out of their control. What should they do when they go to see their GP and an antidepressant medication is suggested? I, I think a lot of people will find that if they're not too keen to take a pill, the, lots of doctors won't be too unhappy with this. A lot of us have got into the habit of just handing these things out. So if people push back a bit, they may find that they're doctors quite open to that. But the other thing to bear in mind is that these days, people who've got conditions and who go on pills can access the internet and find out about what these things do. Your motivation uh, means you will often know as much, if not more, about the pills than the doctor you go to. And this is not just family doctors. This is specialists like me. You can go on the internet and find out these sort of things about these things. Not 
everything you'll find out will be great, wonderful, and marvelous. And it can be no harm to come and talk to the doctor who may help you work out what are the things you found out are really useful and what other things aren't. But my view is that doctors should be encouraging people to go on Google. The thing you hear about is don't consult Dr. Google. My view is that everybody should. For instance, what I mentioned earlier about nicotine being a good treatment for OCD or a good treatment for, for anxiety, and that there are clinical trials. It's not just the odd person here or there thinking the idea. It's there's clinical trials that actually show this. This came from patients. It isn't the kind of thing that I'd have thought about. It's people with OCD who we tried all these treatments for, finding out that actually when they went back smoking, the OCD improved much more than it did with any pills. But well, you've done much for the heart disease or lung cancer risk, well, mind you. Sure, but we can get nicotine patches and things like that, which are going to be uh, actually much, much safer. But what I'm trying to bring out is we need to try and create a world. It's not just people going to doctors who get told about SSRIs. A lot of doctors complain these days that they've got hundreds of heart sink patients. That's the word they use. People who come in to see them and can't get the right treatment. And part of the problem here is, well, of course, if the guidelines say use these drugs, but the clinical trials, when you get to see the data, show, well, these drugs don't work. It's not going to be a huge surprise that you're left with a bunch of patients who aren't doing well. You know, the job becomes more fun for the doctor. It's also a much better outcome for the patient. It should be one where I encourage you to let me know about anything odd that happens. And it isn't just as regards making love. I mean, the SSRIs affect every system in the body. They'll affect your vision and things like this. You know, there's a ton of things that you're going to be the expert on because you're taking the pill and you can access the internet and work these things out and come back and report to me. And increasingly, that's how I learn. It's not from books and things like that. So, yeah, there's a lot of incentive, I think, there for us all between us as patients, but also doctors. If you appreciate that the person coming into you is highly likely to be right and is very motivated to get the right answer. So it's about really building a different sort of working practice. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much indeed for talking today. Really interesting. Thanks for asking me to talk, Liz. It's been good fun. Great. Well, thanks so much, David. Bye. Okay. Bye. Hope you enjoyed the latest episode of the podcast. Many thanks for listening. And a reminder, you can follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker and sign up to the podcast mailing list at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. In the next episode, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Shilpa Ravella, a transplant gastroenterologist with expertise in nutrition, who argues that more and more research suggests that low-level inflammation, which many of us suffer from, is tied to the majority of our chronic diseases. And she explains what we need to do to change this. Do join me in the next podcast to find out more. Many thanks for listening. Bye for now.